We're all very much aware that this is the high energy part of the afternoon, and we're going to do our, uh, our best to, com uh, to, to deal with that, uh, that reality. Uh, I'm going to very uh, quickly uh, introduce the, uh, the panelists, although you have, as before, their um, uh, longer CVs in this little book. Uh, Steve Weber is Professor of Political Science and former director of the Inst Institute of International Studies at UCB Berkeley. And he is the co-director of something called the New Era Foreign Policy Project, which uh, may or may not come into this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, conversation. Janice Gross-Stein is the Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Poli Sci and the director of the Monk Center for International Studies at the uh, University of Toronto and is the ubiquitous Canadian whom you see uh, all the time on every issue that uh, has any uh, possible implication for uh, uh, for international affairs. Uh, Roberta Jackson became Deputy Assistant Secretary for Canada, Mexico, and NAFTA issues in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs in the Department of uh, State in 2007. She has served uh, extensively in the Americas for the United States government and worked also for the uh, uh, United Nations at an earlier time in her uh, career. And for Paul, to Paul Heinbecker, the United Nations, of course, worked for him uh, when he was the uh, uh, Canadian ambassador to the, uh, the United Nations. He is now, he has been the inaugural director of the Center for Global Relations at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University and, quotes, a distinguished fellow at the uh, Independent Center for International Governance Innovation in uh, Waterloo in Ontario. Uh, everybody has read and put to memory the uh, text um, with its absolutely unprovocative thesis that the world is made up of policy makers and uh, uh, policy takers. Before we get into that, I should just state something that I've been assuming and that is going to be the rule for at least this session, if not for others, and that is that we are on Chatham House rules uh, here and the conversation can consequently be as frank as it, uh, uh, as it needs to be. The policy maker taker um, idea is, is, uh, was deliberately framed to be, uh, to be provocative and we uh, expect that it will be. There was another phrase that I found interesting in the paper, which was, and I quote, uh, the Obama administration is required to demonstrate positive conceptual articulation about how it sees the world. Uh, I don't know which one of you wrote that in these co-written papers. That's the... She wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you want to go off Chatham House rules now. Yeah. Uh, it suffice to say that while that referred to the Obama administration, it uh, also refers uh, strongly to the Canadian administration. And that is a challenge that is uh, facing, um, uh, facing both governments. In that sense, while the paper and the discussion, I think, were anticipated to be very much about the border and its thickening or ineffectiveness within, uh, between our two countries, uh, we are dealing very explicitly in a broad North American con context, and we are dealing very explicitly in a wide world uh, whose changes have impacts upon uh, everything that, uh, that we are doing here. So I am anticipating that the discussion will not be too narrowly about borders, uh, exclusively and nor too narrowly about uh, North American uh, exclusively. The world is um, changing in its power relationships uh, and in its problems. Uh, that's the world that's changing, not just its continents. Its implications uh, uh, are evident on the, uh, with respect to the continent. I think everyone would agree with David Emerson's observation in the last uh, uh, session that, uh, none, that, that we have all benefited wherever we live uh, from uh, the strength and leadership of the North American continent and that that uh, has to be borne in mind as we uh, proceed forward, but uh, that as part of a, uh, of a whole. I'm hoping that this uh, conversation may focus upon opportunities uh, that we face, not simply a reiteration of problems. I was encouraged by Bob Pastor's uh, observations at the end of, or questioned at the end of the last panel that asked us to try to talk about specific ways and specific things that, uh, that, that might be pursued, and I hope that might also be uh, an element of, uh, of this discussion. There's been an agreement that the uh, co-authors 
Uh, we'll each uh, start with, um, uh, with seven minutes rather than with the ten that they were solemnly promised. And uh, so I will judge you on that basis. And Janice, are you to begin? I'm, Janice will begin. Thank you uh, very much, Joe. And I think prime ministers are the only people who read conference papers. Uh, <laughs> I'm struck by that. Um, I think the panel discussion that we just finished actually made Steve's and my task easier um, because, and we were both remarking that somehow when you think about economic and security issues and how tightly connected these issues are, um, somehow the economists are always ahead. They actually see the world changing uh, with much greater ease than the security people do who tend to focus on why things stay the same. And Steve's in my paper is essentially about change uh, and what the challenges are for Canada in that world. The origins of the conference are quite interesting because we each got separate letters. And with, would you please address these questions? And for anybody who thinks about the Canada-US relationship, there were all the usual suspects. Uh, and I read the questions and I thought, there's absolutely nothing new I can say about these. And I phoned to Steve and I said, let's break the rules. Um, let's write a paper together. One joint paper uh, by a Canadian and American focusing on security issues. And actually that's a metaphor uh, for the paper that we want to do. Um, let me just make one other preparatory comment before I, and this one don't count my time on. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Alan. This is not the Monk Center? This is not the Monk Center, that's right. <laughs> it will be uh, soon. Yeah. <laughs> Alan uh, Gottlieb this morning, uh, I think, opened the discussion up wide uh, when he reflected um, on the difficulties uh, of creating shared space uh, in North America. This is a conversation that we've been having in Canada, really, for at least a decade. Uh, and Alan's presentation, as usual, was honest, uh, wise, and it made me think again uh, what a national treasure we have um, with Alan Gottlieb, uh, who has that capacity to look back and say, Gee, I think differently than I did uh, a decade ago. So you do not count my time for that one minute there. No, I, that? <laughs> I know you would. Uh, let me t we start our paper with two stories, both of which are true, and I think reflect the argument we want to make. So for everybody other than Joe Clark, let me tell you the stories, because he's the only reader. First story was the 48 hours before the inaugural of President Obama, where his team spent 48 hours struggling over intelligence information that a Somali would cross from, the, from Canada into the US and attempt to firebomb a reviewing stand. They debated, they decided eventually to take the risk and go ahead, and it only became apparent after the fact that this intelligence was planted by one group of Somalis anxious to discredit the other group of Somalis. But if you think about this for a moment, this picture that you have in your head, this is the introduction to the Obama people that Canada gets. This is the frame as they prepare to take office. Second story is Pearson Airport. For those Canadians who came to this conference through Pearson Airport in Toronto, uh, it is, I can only say, an ennobling experience as you stand in line for three hours, uh, it, Jeffrey shaking his head, it is really quite a unique experience and it's worth dwelling on only for one minute. There is no airport in the United States that has security procedures where you stand in line for three hours to be inspected, certified, searched, and whatever else is necessary for an hour flight. And that's effectively what Canadians are going through if they come through that airport to go anywhere in the United States. So the transaction costs are very large and growing. And to put my point bluntly, we have a thicker and a dumber border than we've ever had, frankly. And that sets the scene for the challenges that Steve and I faced. And I am quite pessimistic, as Alan is that we can actually fix this for a whole variety of reasons which we've talked about all day. It's that that led then, 
um, us to make two arguments, and then I'm going to hand it over to Steve. The first of these, that on the security issue, Canada is a policy taker, and the United States is a policy maker. Pearson Airport implemented enhanced security regulations before the TSA issued them in Washington, right? Anybody who was around on the 25th and 26th of December, 27th, trying to get out of Pearson Airport knows that we were ahead of every airport in the United States. Um, we anticipated what the regulations would be. We implemented them. And frankly, we take policy. And we have virtually no capacity to negotiate the rules in any significant way. And I think this is likely on the security field. Now, Paul said to me at lunch, you're wrong because the policymaker was Al-Qaeda, the policy taker is the United States, and that's correct, but as far as Canada is concerned, we are the policy taker in that relationship. So, second issue, then, and if we can't fix it, uh, how do we think then together about our future, which is the challenge uh, that we face? And Michael Wilson, I think, put a quite in, in, you know, quite um, provocatively, in an exit interview that he had, he said, look, as the ambassador from Canada to Washington, uh, I'm sure that Ambassador Gottlieb would agree with him on this, it's difficult to get attention on the bilateral agenda. So how do we get attention in a very noisy, crowded, fractious um, environment full of static? It's actually by raising, working together on global issues that the United States cares about, that Canada gets airtime in Washington. What that really suggests then is for Canada, it has to demonstrate, and um, Jeremy, you said this this morning in your introduction, it's got to demonstrate on security issues its value proposition over and over and over again. And there are two comments that I will make about that. First of all, if, you, if my American friend's in the room, we cannot afford to make a single mistake on the border. Now, I would like any policymaker to be in a world where they cannot make an error once. That's the world Canada finds itself in, and it's a very unforgiving world, frankly. That's the first point. The second point is that conventional wisdom is, if we have to demonstrate our value proposition, well, we join coalitions of the willing, regardless of what the issue is, frankly, and we demonstrate our value proposition. Well, I put that one on the, tape, paper, on the table, too, and said, is that true? It's not at all clear to me it's true. It's not clear to me, and this is not, don't misconstrue what I'm going to say, but if the reason for Afghanistan and what we've done in Afghanistan for a decade now was to demonstrate our value proposition to the United States, frankly, we're yesterday's story in Washington now. Where's the value add? Where does, how does it, in fact, spill over into other policy issues that really matter to Canada? So I would like at least to put a big question mark around that rather than just to assume that there's policy payoff that comes from that kind of commitment. That led Steve and me then to say, let's think out about the world. Let's think about opportunities. What are the global challenges which the United States and others, not only the United States, China and others are likely to face over the next decade? Uh, what, where are there opportunities to work with the United States? And how can we grow the policy space where there might be, in fact, some value add? And that's where I'm going to turn to Steve. Thank you, Janice. Um, I'm going to pick up that thought uh, by talking a little bit about the nature of disequilibria. Um, it's not all a good news story. Actually. I mean, when people talk about opportunities for collaboration on a global account in the future, it sounds often quite hopeful um, and aspirational and even optimistic. Um, and there are elements of all those characteristics in play, um, but it's not all a good news story. And to kind of pick up the, the, uh, the, the, the underlying problematic thread of that, I want to turn back to a point that um, my colleague Brad DeLong made earlier uh, about the uh, current state of the Treasury paper market. Um, there is a deep, deep disequilibria in that market that Brad pointed out. Um, and the uh, usual explanation that's given for the willingness of the rest of the world, or ROW as we like to call it, um, disparagingly, to accumulate dollar assets to no end is the, everyone's heard this argument, there's no other e e liquid market that can take that kind of assets. And so, you know, we have no choice. Um, I would 
put forward the proposition that there is a similar kind of view out there, um, but it's actually, ironically, I think, held more fully by the Canadians than by almost anyone else in the world right now, except maybe some aging Western Europeans, that the same is true of the market for American security leadership. In other words, we don't really like it, but, quote, there is no alternative. Now, if there's one take-home argument from the paper that we've tried to construct, um, it is the following with regard to the there is no alternative argument. This is an old um, claim uh, that usually uh, is attributed to Margaret Thatcher uh, from the early 80s. She used the word Tina, there is no alternative. It actually goes back to the scenario guys at Royal Dutch Shell who created in, in the 70s to talk about um, the same argument. She stole it from them. Um, in any case, uh, it's a great argument for the rest of the world to believe if you're sitting in the United States. That there is no alternative to American leadership, whether it be in the treasury market or in the security leadership market or the market for governance. Because um, what it really says, and it hit a very, I think, a deep emotional kind of uh, resonance for folks in that generation was, look, no matter how much you don't like American leadership, no matter how much those treasury assets are going to depreciate over the next 10 years, at the end of the day, the alternative to American-led order is chaos, there, which, which effectively is no alternative because the historical analogy is the 1930s. And oh yeah, by the way, if you forgot, the historical analogy is the 1930s. And let me remind you about what happened in the 1930s, and we definitely don't want to do that again. So, the alternative to American leadership is the 1930s, there is no alternative, and in fact, the single best, excuse me, the single worst thing you can do is challenge the United States. Because if you win, you lose. Now, as I said, this is a wonderful set of beliefs, and I've cartooned them a little bit, forgive me, but. A wonderful set of beliefs if you're sitting in Washington for the rest of the world to believe. Um, it puts us in a position of being able to stretch out the underlying leadership proposition quite a lot longer than it otherwise would have been. And let me point out that you know this is a great thing, and it feels quite stable until the moment at which it isn't. And in fact, that's the way disequilibria in these markets usually come. I mean, at the moment at which it, cha it changes dramatically. Now, we were having a little conversation over lunch, which I just want to kind of recapture. Um, the, I, I go to a lot of these conversations and, you know, with Americans and others, and the number of times I, I hear people say, we're living in what there are emerging great powers, and China is rising. And I just I shake my head and I say, what's with the, you know, what is that, future conjunctive tense? Mm. This is not the future. This is present day. These are not emerging. They have emerged. Okay? And when you are in the Gulf, and when you are in Beijing and Shanghai and other places, uh, th there's no future tense to this argument. This is the present. Okay? And the question now is what to do about it. Um, I will say that in the minds of those outside of the establishment, and I include in this case not just you know, the old Republican Party, but my friends in the Democratic Party, um, Tina is everywhere else in the world replaced by the term, that, you know, there must be an alternative, let's create it. And in fact, when one starts to look around the world, one can see what look like sort of factoids of the creation of alternative institutional mechanisms, alternative opportunities for leadership. We laugh at them, we sort of dismiss them as kind of marginal things. So the uh, Chiang Mai Initiative, the Shanghai Cooperation Organ, the, the things that one looks at and says, these are efforts not so much to challenge American leadership directly, but to root around American leadership, to create alternatives. This is what bargaining is about. Bargaining is about creating alternatives. If we are sitting here in North America waiting to see the challenge to American leadership take the form of a direct confrontation as you know, a late 1800s rising hegemony story that every political scientist has drilled into his head during, or his or her head during graduate school, we'll never see it because that's not the way it gets done. It gets done in exactly the sort of subterranean, and I don't mean subterranean in a pejorative sense. I just mean in a strategic sense, in the option of creating alternatives. Okay, the risk in all that, and then I'll stop beating that um, horse to a pulp is that the Americans and the Canadians together will be the last to see that dynamic. I can tell you that my friends in Washington are, are the last to see that dynamic. I would like to see the Canadians jointly, excuse me, gently, comfortingly educate us about it. 
And I think we could do that on three, three dimensions of important global issues that are stretching out over the next decade where leadership is going to be required. Let me just say what they are really, really quickly and then turn it back to Janice to wrap up because she will always get it right. Um, look, one has to do with the question of, and these are all, let's call them global account issues on which the United States, at least I believe, has to take a position over the next couple of years that establishes a kind of coherent intellectual presence for the Obama administration and whatever may succeed it, which goes beyond, hey, we're not George Bush. Aren't you happy to see us? That, I mean, that we, we got something out of that for a few months, and, but for most of the world, that, those days are over. Um, here are the three, and, and they're very, very simple. And again, they're meant to be uh, both a little bit general and a little bit provocative. One is the diffusion of power and the blurring of boundaries. Um, as I said, this is not something that is you know, emerging. This is something that has happened. Um, it is in the process of uh, happening to both other states and to non-state actors. We don't have a clear position on whether we think that's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, we sort of hedge it. When I say we, I mean the United States. We hedge it with arguments like burden sharing and responsibility sharing and phrases like, and, and I love the speech, um, forgive me for this, quoting Bob Zelig, um, we tell the Chinese we want them to be a responsible stakeholder, which is defined as, you guys pay for our view of world order. Um, here's my question that the United States will have to answer over the course of the next couple of years, maybe sooner and to which I believe the Canadians could make an interesting and valuable contribution that maybe we could hear. Look, is Washington ready to take yes for an answer to that question? From China in particular, but from others as well. Um, and so, you know, maybe the iconic cartoon story of 2016 on that um, point will be, um, when the uh, first major grant is made from, I don't know, let's say the Abu Dhabi Global Development Foundation, to the city of New Orleans, will the federal government in Washington permit that to happen? Will we invite it? Will we like it? Maybe it'll come through Canada. That'll make it easy for us to decide. Um, <laughs> second, the obsession, and forgive me for this, but I think it's an unhealthy obsession. Most obsessions are unhealthy. Um, this one is particularly unhealthy. The obsession with process over outcome. Uh, if I get involved in another argument about multilateralism versus unilateralism, I am going to shoot myself. Um, that's not a real argument. The rest of the world doesn't really care about process in that. Now, look, I'm overstating the case. There are reasons to be concerned about the legitimacy of political processes, right? Um, but look, the con it, it, this is a bargaining game, as I said. And bargaining, as we know, is all about creating alternatives. While we're arguing about whether it should be a multilateral or bilateral or a unilateral or whatever sort of process for making decisions, the rest of the world is moving on and creating de facto fait accomplis on issues like the nuclear regime, on energy supplies, on technology standards, soon enough I believe on currency and reserves as well. Um, we need to get out of the space of being so focused on whether it's the G2, the G20, the G8, and start putting together the solutions to problems. We can argue that this is a non-ideological, technocratic stance towards problem solving. But in fact, there are a lot of people in the rest of the world who would like to see us take that position. And I feel like, in some significant way, uh, the Canadians would be a very friendly presence in that kind of a conversion when we think about our sort of view of how we're going to relate to the rest of the world. And finally, lastly, Call it the shadow of the future. Look, um, here's the dirty little secret of globalization. It didn't work for three billion people on the planet. In their minds, they have nothing to lose from it coming to an end. Right? They may be wrong. They might, we, we can argue about whether that's right or wrong. I'm saying about what they believe. Okay. Um, the American century, which was, by the way, the last one, not the, necessarily the coming one. Um, did not deal with the fundamental challenge of what I see to be modern global politics, and it is simply this, can we help make that next three billion get rich, or at least richer, without poisoning the planet? I thought the last panel teed that question up um, very well. I don't think it's going to be solved as simply and as pragmatically as 
uh, Brad suggested. Um, and it requires the United States to take a position of at least some form of leadership with regard to what we think our view is on this question. We really haven't done that um, in a serious and adult way. DC and the rest of the American population have all the zeal and all the untutored confusion on this issue of new converts. We decided in 2005 that it was a problem, that there was something called the environment which was a problem. And in, like my mother when she stopped smoking, um, suddenly nobody else in the world could smoke. Um, now, the rest of the world asks, by what rhyme or reason are we actually calculating our discount rates? Our view of what our time frame is for making progress on this set of issues and how we explain that to the rest of the world. I find enormous confusion when I go outside the United States as to where we are on that score. And I would call it out for the Canadians in the following sense. It follow, well, what we do on that issue, as we say in the paper, sets the parameters under which Canada has to make a choice. You can be a hydrocarbon economy, or maybe you can be an environmental leader, but you probably can't be both. And the character of your decision depends on what it is, I believe, over the next couple of years, in part, um, is decided inside Washington about the nature of the kind of discounting rate, or shall I call it, time frame for progress on this issue. Um, if you're going to be a policy taker, that's one place where it's going to affect your interests most boldly. Um, I would want to step up to the plate and get ahead of that set of conversations to try to frame them more effectively for the American elite than have been um, framed. Let me end um, and turn it back to Janice for a quick wrap up, if we have time, with the following statement. Um, the, the prior panel's conversation about um, the dysfunctionality of American government strikes us all, you know, I think is, you know, intuitively right. Uh, Jazz said there's no good metric. He's right. Um, by the same token, there's a lot of emotion around it. Um, by the same token, it all makes us feel good to complain about how dysfunctional the Washington elite is and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if it's right or if it's wrong, but I will say this. Um, the United States needs friends. <laughs> We don't have that many friends in the world right now. Um, we have a lot of people who want to like us for various sorts of reasons. We have a lot of people who want to work with us for lots of reasons, not least of which is our material and technological capabilities to bring to the table. But we don't have a lot of real friends that we have a deep, trusted, intellectual relationship with combined with a kind of cultural, um, how can I put this, uh, bon ami, if I can do bad French. Um, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> and if the American political elite is really is bad at anything, in my view, it is really bad at facing us up to the fact that it has to make gut wrenching choices about things and values that it doesn't want to trade off against each other. Um, because we, you know, we haven't had to do that for much of the second half of the 20th century, um, and we'd like to believe that we never have to do that. And in fact, it's sort of almost a characteristic of Americans to say that if somebody tells you you have to make a hard choice and you can't have your cake and eat it too, you're just not thinking ambitiously enough about the issue. And you ought to be a disruptor instead. Mm. Um, there is a level of immaturity in that conversation that needs to be comfortably, gently, and sweetly modified. And who would one ask to do that except Janice Stein? <laughs> Just two quick uh, wrap-up comments. One um, is to echo what Steve says, process isn't policy. And uh, a kind of religious incantation around multilateralism isn't policy. And it's not problem solving. Uh, if it w and, and we've kind of got it backwards, in a sense, because the focus is so heavily uh, on process. Uh, to return to a question that we ask in the paper, would Canada take yes, take yes from the United States? Were the United States, in fact, really seriously to say, um, there has to be greater burden sharing. There has to be greater engagement. <coughs> There is a new world, there are new players, and there are differential obligations that flow from coming to the table. Um, are we prepared to come if we have to pair away? It's not clear that we are either. It's not clear that we're prepared to take ES in Canada, or that we're ready to, or that we've invested 
in the kinds of, in our foreign service, in our aid program, in all the other instruments that it takes to actually say yes uh, if the opportunity is there. So I think that's something for us to take home uh, as well. Thank you, both of you. Um, I don't know which one of you was 30 seconds over your 14, but uh, it was uh, well worth it. Uh, I'd uh, like to uh, uh, let me gather my note. Turn now to, to Roberta, and I guess a question I'd like to ask you, if I might, is um, on the question of takers and makers. Is um, uh, is Canada really just a policy taker? Is that the you're, we're off the record here? Is that the official view of the U.S. <laughs> State Department? <laughs> I was um, actually looking at my BlackBerry, not because I do that in the middle of a panel discussion like this, but because I was, I'm sorry that we can't put it up larger, but I was going to the page that shows Robert Gibbs at the White House briefing today in his Canada hockey jersey. <laughs> as an example of Canada being remembered in Washington, and yes, the beer is on the way. So um, it is not true that everyone in Washington wakes up not thinking about Canada every day. <laughs> you um, <laughs> um, but I also wondered a little bit about how I got myself into the situation where I'm the only actual lowly bureaucrat who's um, presenting anything today. Um, well, well, the, the secret which is, is why Joe, which no, is the, why Joe reminded people yeah, about but the, the rest of the record thing. The rest of us think we're important. <laughs> I came here to learn, so, and I'm happy to do so. You know, I think a lot of what, what's been said are things that, that those of us who work on the bilateral relationship actually do accept every day. Um, we, we do accept that, that, in fact, we would like this relationship to be a little bit more prominent. We think there are benefits to both countries, um, that we think, um, that we have to look at new ways to cooperate and collaborate, especially as we confront, and I will now begin to call them fully emerged powers, um, having come right through the chrysalis. Um, but, but I think also we have a tendency to, um, you know, have a tendency to fall back a little bit on, on each of our sort of traditional roles. Um, and, and get a little bit stuck uh, in, in some of the debates over uh, who should go first and who has more ability to transform the relationship. And we're so big that obviously we have to lead and Canada is, um, you know, has a traditional uh, responsibility to sort of respond to the situation of the elephant below. Um, I actually think we're beginning to move past that. Um, I think that the relationship is changing, and it's changing, I think, for two reasons, which should not really be um, understated in some respects. Janice talks about Canada not being able to make even a single mistake. Clearly, that's not being portrayed as a good thing. <laughs> um, I would argue that with the differential focus that the United States has post 9-11, uh, a focus that, that, and I would certainly agree that things have changed. Things have changed for Americans in the way they view the world. Things have changed at the border. Um, although I think there are a lot of other things that have changed too. Uh, Ten years of you know, dramatically increased trade, soaring gasoline and, and transportation prices, higher exchange rates, all sorts of other things actually did change around the same time. Um, but, but in that post 9-11 world, Canada, in many ways, becomes more important to the United States, not less. Um, and that is something that I think can actually be um, exploited, if you will. But only if we look at it a little bit differently than I think we have already. Um, so I think you know, the, the way that we look at both the border and international threats continues to have to be one of partnership. Um, and not one of a sort of a zero sum, uh, you know, constantly worrying about whether Canada is getting as much as it should out of the relationship. And possibly that's because right now there are echoes of similarity in the discussion about who should lead. 
if Canada wants to move North America ahead more than the United States does right now, um, I actually think it might be a good time for Canada to put a proposal forward to the United States, a vision, a, a plan. The answer to that that I often get as a U.S. government official is, we're a minority government. That, that's not going to happen while we're a minority government. Okay? I understand that. Um, but then I guess the answer that we give similarly is, oh, God, you don't have any idea what our political situation is. And of course, anybody sitting through this entire conference now would. It's, you know, I think I'm just going to go and quit my job when I go home since <laughs> really depressed about what I can do. Um, but, but I think, you know, we're both going to get stuck there. Um, so one of the things we do is, is look for ways, I think a little bit, as Tom Pickering said, to move forward on the tactical from below, if you will, and then continue to try and work on ways to get something coming down from above for which we can be ready. Um, and I think that, that some of the things that we've been doing uh, really, really have the possibility, the potential, uh, to improve that. I think, for example, and, and Janice and I talked about this a little bit at lunch, and I believe her words were pipe dream. Um, I think perimeter security is something that we need to begin talking about. I think nine years post 9-11, we finally can. I think we couldn't uh, earlier uh, on both sides for different reasons, and, and I think that was really hard. But I think it's something that we need to start talking about now, and it's probably going to take quite a while. But that also involves looking at the border itself, at the 49th parallel, as something, and I don't, I don't know whether it gets thinner and smarter, and, I, and I'm not sure what the, what the metaphor down. is. But, <laughs> Well, that was, that was your metaphor. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it'll get thinner and smarter, I guess. Because my, what I'm saying is I think what we're looking for as we push this vision forward is where the border and the juridical line becomes, frankly, one component in a security relationship, possibly even a lesser important component than our other areas of security. And in, in reducing its importance as you know, the, the, the Maginot line of, of security, you also obviously will facilitate a, a freer flow of traffic and trade and, and legitimate commerce. Um, but I also think in the international arena, we are not necessarily capitalizing on our membership of all of those alphabet soup of, of uh, organizations. Um, the fact that we are members of, you know, and, and, and I, I can't remember who on the previous panel listed them, but, but that was actually only a partial listing and it was pretty long. We have talked for quite a while about a sort of a North American caucus in those entities. You know, whether it's APEC, uh, whether it's the OAS, uh, other areas. Um, I'm not sure that we're really doing that yet, and I think that could be extraordinarily useful to us. It does not mean that the three countries, that the U.S. and Canada, nor that the U.S., Canada, and Mexico will always see things the same way going into meetings of those organizations, but surely we ought to be thinking about the one or two most important issues that a meeting of those groups are going to deal with and what we want to come out of it. And there I think, you know, the, the situation in organizations like that, which are generally consensus-based, some are voting-based, uh, but are generally consensus-based, Canada plays an enormous role um, in persuasion, in leadership, uh, in working with countries in the Caribbean and elsewhere who can have a determinative impact uh, in some of these organizations and therefore, in a sense, has outsized power uh, and can exercise it with the United States as we move to make decisions. Um, I would argue also that, um, for better or worse, Afghanistan is not yesterday's story. Um, but Afghanistan is possibly not yesterday's story only if we're prepared to talk about beyond 2011. So that really is going to be the difficulty that we confront. Um, and I know that that is incredibly difficult. And, and I am not arguing that it is something that would be easy uh, to contemplate. Um, but in some respects, because the United States and this administration is confronting Afghanistan again, we're really into phase two, if you will. Um, we will probably ask our neighbors to the north to help us confront that uh, you know, with us. 
Um, and that's, that's going to be very difficult, I understand that. Uh, but if it really is yesterday's story, then, then that too may be sort of a lost opportunity to, to continue to work together, uh, as difficult as that is. Um, other areas, obviously, I could list a whole bunch that I think are incredibly important in the relationship and in advancing uh, what we do together to the benefit of both countries. Haiti is obviously a huge one. Haiti is an example in which Canadian leadership, uh, not just Canadian participation, has made a huge difference. The conference in Montreal at the end of January, uh, preparations for the donors meeting at the end of this month, um, I think are, are very important. Um, but there are lots of other examples uh, as well. But I saw in, in Rod Dobell's presentation something that I also think we need to think about and that we talk about in government a lot and I haven't heard as much about. And that is the question of North America as first mover in addressing global dilemmas. Because actually, I think fundamentally, that's where we'd like to get to. Um, you know, it, it's like you, you, you're told when you're raising children all the time, well, model the good behavior, right? Um, and so in part, what we're talking about is can North America model the behavior? Um, and so far, I think we haven't done nearly as much as we could to do that. Um, right now, when we look at our southern border and we see Mexico confronting uh, drug trafficking organizations who uh, clearly uh, have uh, operations in over 200 U.S. cities uh, and in hefty parts of Canada, I would add, including British Columbia, um, th this is all of our problem. And the United States and Canada are beginning to work on that issue and work with Mexico. That is a truly North American problem, even though the, the most violent manifestation of it, obviously, is in Mexico, the most severe. But, but these are the kinds of things that we should be looking at to advance North America um, and try and play that sort of role model. Uh, for other parts of the world. And, and I'm hopeful that we can try and do that, even if, as Ambassador Pickering said earlier today, we start that incrementally um, and not with the, the big vision right now uh, that I think all of us would like to see uh, because of, of other things on the plate. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. Sorry, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul. How many minutes do I have? Uh, one. Thanks. <laughs> you have, take five. Okay, I'll take seven, which is what everybody else is. <laughs> I was just being polite. That's right, I didn't that's right. Um, I want to make um, a different point, I think, although it's more in keeping with uh, sort of some of the things that Tom said and you said uh, a few minutes ago. And that is, uh, I don't, I think pessimism, this room is full of pessimism. Pessimism is more exhilarating than optimism. You can really get yourself worked up over it, but it's not the basis on making policy. We're not, there's much less reason to be pessimistic than, than people are, are talking about. You know, let's talk about, we won't get into the Canadian stuff for a moment, but the, the American future, American science. American science leads the world. <clears throat> The U.S. has won 320 Nobel Prizes. The U.S. won more Nobel Prizes last year than China has ever won. The U.S. has 53 of the top 200 universities, six of the top 10. Let's put this a little bit in perspective. Um, military. The U.S. spends more on its armed forces in the next 15 countries, eight of which are allies. U.S. outspends China seven to one on the military. Now, if you took, made it just five to one, you could actually pay for the whole health care plan. You know, I mean, to govern is to choose, and for some reason, people aren't making the connections in these things. Obama did, the first president I ever heard say, register the idea that you can't pay for everything under, on national security. But nonetheless, the point I'm trying to say is the United States has got capacity. Power is relative. Power is zero sum. Power is like diamonds. It's not forever. But for the lifetimes of practically everybody in this room, especially people my age and older, 
All that we really have to think about is the United States has the capacity. The United States will be as dominant or nearly as dominant as it's ever. It will may, put it another way around, it will not be predominant, but it will be preeminent for a very long time to come. So I think we should, we should, we should wash out of our calculation the, the sort of woe is me uh, uh, view. I remember when, uh, when I succeeded Jeremy in, at the embassy in Washington and Alan Gottlieb was the, the ambassador and Paul Kennedy was filling us with the decline school. And people were saying to us, why would you want a free trade agreement with the United States of all countries? The United States is, is had it. You know, Asia is the future. Well, here we are, I don't remember who it was, George Schultz, I think, said to you, the United States economy takes a lot of killing. <laughs> and I think that we're in that situation. Sure, there's great debts, sure, there's great deficits, sure, there's gonna be great problems, but this is the most resilient society the world has ever seen. You really think that it, everybody has just given up? I don't think that that's the case. If you look at, sure, the, the US Congress is dysfunctional, but generally speaking, it's been kind of dysfunctional for as long as some of the rest of us can remember. I believe it's worse now. I believe the culture wars are worse than they, than they were uh, in the days when I was in Washington. But at the same time, you know, the, the presidency is uniquely, is uniquely powerful. And a lot of the things that we can do with the U.S. don't have to do with the Congress. This is kind of contrary to what the conventional wisdom is. You know, you, you want to you have a foreign policy that matters? Let, let's talk about Afghanistan. It's a point I really, it's been bugging me. Let's compare Afghanistan to the Second World War. It's not a fair, apt comparison, but it's a comparison. We are doing the equivalent of saying, we're gonna supply, because we did, a million five hundred thousand troops, billions of dollars, loads of equipment, huge training programs, but we're gonna do it until 1944. And then we're out of there, because we'll have done our share. But here we are in Afghanistan with 2,800 soldiers, and we're saying, 20, or 2011, we're out of there, we've done our share. Either, it's, either there was a reason for going in the first place, and if there wasn't, the conservative government when it came to office should have got us out of there the day after. And, and if there is a reason for going there, then we should, we should be there to, to stick with it. If we don't think it's going, if we think Obama's assessment, that painfully reached assessment, that it really matters to American national security, if we think that that's wrong, I guess we can say so. I mean, we said that in Iraq. We thought they were wrong in Iraq, and we were right, and they were wrong. We could say it again in Afghanistan. But we can't say we're just leaving without, you know, so I'm, I'm not surprised. I think it, what you said is going to have dismayed a lot of Canadians, but I'm not surprised. I think people were hoping that we could kind of sneak out. Haiti is another one. Arms control and disarmament, lots that we can do uh, on a common agenda there. There are plenty of things that Canada can do with the United States which serve our interests, but which also advance uh, the, the common interest. I think, uh, I won't say, uh, how much time do I have left? I have this, oh, I forgot to start it. I have this very fancy uh, thing which is, requires you to turn it on before it works. <laughs> anyway, it's waiting. I now have seven minutes. <laughs> I think the, the world that we're going into is, and this is a Canadian point now, I think it's right up our alley. I think that we're, we, we're, we're looking at a golden future. The United States will remain powerful, economically strong, a great market, maybe it could be better, maybe it could be worse, it'll be up sometimes, down sometimes, but it's going to be very good. And we're gonna have the, the rest of the world, there's gonna be China, there's gonna be India, there's gonna be Brazil, there's gonna be Europe, Russian bear. There's all kinds of things that are going to be happening that from which we can profit, and if we're smart enough and agile enough, and I would, and we used to be, that we can benefit from it. This is a world that's made, made for our kind of diplomacy. So all we, you know, what we need is some vision and some leadership and some will, and we can do, and, and we can really do great things. And I'm sort of where Jim Baker is. You, you don't have, there's not gonna be a conflict with China unless people will it to be so. It doesn't have to be the case. So let's, you know, this is, this is where we come in. This is the kind of thing that we can do. I mean, we're not gonna be interpreting the Chinese to the Americans, I don't for one second think that. But we are going to find lots of places in the interstices of all of these problems 
where we can make a positive impact, where we can be useful to ourselves, we can be helpful to the Americans, we can make a lot of money, we can be a lot richer than we are now, and everything is going to be fine. I couldn't be more optimistic. I think that the future is really, really golden. And I think when we look back and we think of the golden age of Pearson, we're going to actually think that it wasn't so golden in comparison. Thanks. Hmm. <laughs> I want to pick up on that. I've just been swayed by that evangelistic uh, proposal. <laughs> by, uh, but I want to pick up on the optimism from a Canadian perspective, and then I want to say something about political problems. Um, I agree with uh, Paul that uh, this is, in fact, an opportunity for some of the virtues that Canada, whether accurately or not, has called our assets uh, to be applied with far more effectiveness than um, other opportunities uh, if we chose to apply them. And I'm fascinated by the idea of uh, North America as a first mover on, uh, on global dilemmas. Uh, being a first mover means that uh, that's an action, not, that is an act of persuasion and of uh, very constructive coalition building, not, uh, uh, not the coalition of the willing that we, we had in the past, but of drawing people in who, um, uh, and it doesn't assume that people are going to drop drop into line, but there are a range of issues. Paul has enumerated um, uh, some of them. Roberta has enumerated all of us. And everyone on the panel has enumerated some of them where that could be moved. One last point I want to make, and I make it with some real trepidation because it has to do with, um, uh, with political obstacles. Um, uh, one person who does not appear to me to be intimidated by the gridlock in the U.S. political system is your president. And uh, that is uh, a, uh, I think he's right. Uh, there is, uh, it's a system that, uh, that can, uh, can, uh, can move, can be made to move. What's uh, delicate for me to talk about is what minority governments can do, because uh, I unfortunately demonstrated uh, some of the things, some of the carelessness with, with, with which we shouldn't act. But it's, it's worth noting that, uh, again, going back to the Pearson government, principally domestically, but also, uh, uh, also internationally, um, from a minority position, they took extraordinary measures that took a lot of courage and got accepted. And the trouble is that in any system, political or otherwise, you can always find excuses for ducking. And uh, the, uh, the challenge now in a circumstance where, our, where circumstances are changing and our interests are being challenged uh, or opportunities being created across a, a wide range of fronts, we should not be searching for excuses uh, not to act. We should be very diligently looking for ways in which um, uh, things can be moved forward. So I, um, uh, I think now I've talked my way past the spell that Paul cast. Uh, we'll see if the, uh, if the rest of you do. And I'd like to um, uh, turn it to the audience. It's going to be very populist here and go to uh, uh, the most, and, and uh, go, what's your title? <laughs> what's your title, Jerry? Regis the Regis Professor, uh, <laughs> Professor Ambassador, His Excellency Kinsman. <laughs> <laughs> Count to Roberta, uh, a little episode when I was uh, what we uh, uh, quaintly call high commissioner in London. In Italian, it's much better. It's alto commissario. I liked it very much. Um, on the 10th anniversary of NAFTA, the, uh, my American colleague and my Mexican colleague and I, I have to say that your American colleague went in a helicopter. We went to the party conferences in Britain, which are very important, the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party. And we actually gave parties. We gave NAFTA 10th anniversary parties. So I was skeptical. I thought that there was going to be some kind of leakage uh, from each of us in identity. It was the opposite. I think everybody was enhanced because, as someone once said to me in London, when we were being ignored all the time, do the unexpected. And it was unexpected that Canada and Mexico and the United States would co-present themselves as a thing, as a thing. And you know, it worked. 
Um, let me tell you what I wish worked a little better. When we designed this conference, we put together scholars and practitioners. I got a feeling you're missing each other, okay? The scholars are talking on a level of abstraction that is missing the practical realities and challenges of the world today. I picked up something since Alan Gottlieb's here that Alan wrote that I think is absolutely still true. He wrote a few years ago, the US remains the only state that articulates and acts upon a global strategic vision. That's true. And I think that as an ally in a community uh, with the United States, that we can contribute to that, Janice. But I would like to comment on something you said. It is not a question of joining a coalition of the willing just to demonstrate our loyalty. Mm -hmm. We have to do what we authentically are. And what I think we authentically are, increasingly, is North American. And I don't think there's anything wrong with asserting that. And I think that our challenge, in meeting your challenge of putting forward a proposal, is that the United States also begin to behave as North Americans. I'd like to know what you think of that mm. and how you think, I mean, there are lots of things that Paul mentioned about arms control, about uh, verification, a whole ton of stuff we can do. About Afghanistan, I have to say I disagree with you. I think we've been chewed up. Uh, we were spent 155 dead, a billion, billions more. It's up to other people now to move into NATO. But let's put that aside. What, what can we do together? This, uh, this um, uh, North America as first mover thing, I think is the most important thing said in the conference. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, <laughs> is there a comment from the panel, anyone on the panel? Sure, I, I know Roberta wants to answer your question, Jeremy, <laughs> and I'll let her answer it. But let me tell you, in order for North America as first mover to make sense, both governments have to identify as North America, right? And, well, both, we can in the United States and Mexico as well. And in fact, very pragmatically, very practically, that's not the case. That's not the case. So Roberta can say that that's what she wishes, but in fact, speaking as a realist, that's absolutely not the case. Were there to be a real commitment to being North American, we would not have a thickened and stupider border 10 years later. We would have found ways around it. And in our argument at lunch, Roberta and I, she said, well, we, you know, we need to think creatively about a common security perimeter. She's the idealist, I'm the realist. We have extended sovereignty at Pearson Airport, and we're waiting. You are sovereign at Pearson Airport, and we're standing in line for three hours. That's not thinking like a North American. So I wish you were right. I just don't see it. The, uh, in order for the three countries to think as North Americans, they need not do it simultaneously. And I, as I gathered, Jeremy's point was that Canada may be well positioned uh, to, uh, to take some leadership on this and to... Uh, uh, why? To, why? why? We be, yeah. Well, uh, who would do it better? Of the three, who could do it better? The Mexicans can't. The Americans uh, have their own preoccupations. Uh, it is a it is a field where where we could uh, we could do it better. Anyway, let me retreat to the neutrality of the chair. Next is uh, <laughs> Roberto, Roberta, and then Paul, and then Steve. I actually do think this is a particularly good time for Canada to take a, a leadership role on things North American because. Because we in the United States feel so hemmed in by the political dysfunctionality, if you want to call it that, that there are a lot of people in government who I think if presented with a proposal from the top um, would give it more attention than they otherwise might. In other words, 
This is not, and I think most of us agree, and, and I don't think it's simply a, a reflection of a, of a bureaucrat's frustration, this isn't something that's going to come from below. I mean, we all watched the SPP over the last four years, and the SPP was, and, and I remember getting the instructions. The instructions were twofold. Okay, we got two pieces of instructions from above when we started the SPP. No resources, no new resources, no new legislation. Okay? And I thought, I, 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 what do I do with this? You know? Because we've just been told, think small. Okay? And so we had a really big book with 300 different items on it in English, French, and Spanish, and it's a doorstop for most people. Um, but, but it seems to me that actually you're getting at a harder problem, which is how do we get Americans to think more as North Americans? And, and, I, and I think that clearly it's both a psychological and a political leap that I don't think we've yet made, and therefore in the current political climate is going to be really, really difficult. I mean, I'm enough of a realist to recognize that. Um, so it's part of the reason why I guess I'm hoping, and maybe it's, um, maybe it's a cop-out, uh, that some of this could come externally. And right now, the only, it seems to me, the only person possibly placed with all of the political difficulties to do so is the Canadian Prime Minister, to try and reintroduce that vision to the United States as something that Canada wants to do and to push for. And, and maybe that would get that discussion started again at a high level. I, I don't know. Paul? I think it's certainly the case that it doesn't work bottom up. It doesn't work because the provinces and the states cooperate. Um, I mean, it's good that they do, but part of what they're doing is in the absence of leadership from the top. Um, what I think, though, is we need to keep our thoughts clear. I want to say something about the, sort of the thicker border. I don't think that to think North American means to, to remove borders, necessarily. Uh, I think that that's part of where we go wrong. We think to ourselves, my God, we have to, you know, this is a thick border, it's a stupid border, it's Janet Napolitano's border. Um, you know, we, uh, and somehow we've got to overcome that, and then we can face the world. I don't think we have to do it in that order. I think we have to recognize that we are in this to together. And there are some things will follow from that, but we don't, you don't have to sort of recreate North America before you get started on dealing with the rest of the world. That would be, the second thing is, be careful with the term first mover, because I can tell you on a lot of things, we look a lot more like the last mover than the first mover. You know, think of climate change. Where, where on earth have we been on climate change? You know? Actually, you know, that, that's an interesting <laughs> one for the coming year. Mexico will, co will host COP16. Um, first mover. No, 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 but that's, the point is between now and December, can we do anything with that? Can we exploit Mexico's chairmanship of COP16 to do anything that couldn't be done in Copenhagen? And the answer may very well be no. Um, I don't know. Um, but the point is, if, can, if Mexico's got an interest in this being a success, and Calderon has shown some significant leadership in this area. Is there something we can make of it? Because we've had difficulty with this over the last year. Yeah, but I mean, again, for the record, Harper wants to wait. He said something. Let's take him at his word. He's a, he's a you know, he's prime minister, and he's saying, I don't want to be a yeah, first well, mover. No, no. I want to be the last mover. I don't want it reported that I defended Mr. Harper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but look, we're not here, we shouldn't be confined by what we are. We're talking here about what we could be. And uh, hard positions that countries or individuals have adopted can be changed. Uh, and what we're talking about is where is the range of change. I'm going to go to Steve and then Pierre-Marc and then I'm going back to this uh, democratic audience. I have three, three very, very quick responses to this. Um, on the border, thick, thin, smart, stupid sort of thing. For anyone who's ever lived in New York, it's a really easy problem to solve. Um, as a border, you can never be too thin, too smart, or too rich. Very easy. Um, second, more serious, um, uh, Jeremy, on this issue of, you know, U.S. is the only power in the world with a global agenda. With all due respect, um, and I can say this because we sat together at dinner last night and had a few drinks, um, saying it does not make it so. 
And it's very rare for me to defend the value of academic research, but um, this is a place where numbers actually tell quite a different story. Um, and whatever it is, I mean, we should talk about really, um, rather than argue about you know, what, what the facts are there, the multiple dysfunctionalities of behavior that follow from that belief. Including, I might add, lots of things which push against your aspiration for there to be a North American identity. North American identity is not going to come out of that belief, whether it's right or wrong. Um, third, finally, um, this notion of North America as a first American, very interesting argument, um, and, and I think very compelling in a lot of ways. Um, but it needs to be broken down a little bit. One, you know, one conversation is to say, look, you know, the way you are effectively a first mover is you quote model good behavior, and then we need to have a really serious conversation about who we would expect to follow in that model. Countries don't always act as young children do. Um, sometimes they act as exploiters do. Um, and finally, the alternative to that, because you think, well, they're not going to model good behavior, well, then being a first mover and addressing a, you know, a global public goods problem is paying the bulk of the price. That's right. right? OK, so that's a slightly different kind of you know, uh, commitment. And there are places where we might be able to make that kind of serious commitment. But let's not you know, overreach and imagine that we're going to do it if we're not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to go to, to uh, Pierre Mark Johnson, and then I'm going to take three or four other observations for the floor without a response from the panel, if I might. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, uh, I find the notion of trying to move things on a North American basis interesting. Uh, and it would satisfy Bob Pastor, I'm sure, uh, in many ways. And he would have found this conference to be useful if we come out with that. Um, but there's a, a, an interesting experience that's been going on for years around that. It's North American Commission on Environment, um, which I've studied pretty much and wrote a book about. And I can tell you that uh, it's been marred with problems of low-level bureaucrats, low-level ministers, low budgets, and low self-esteem, ultimately. So I, if we really want to talk North American rather than just play it for the press, I mean, give these people resources, appoint senior people in departments. Uh, the concept of having a North American agenda on the environment has been around for 14 years. Uh, not much has happened. So, Maybe the situation having changed recently and the perspective of the Mexico conference uh, might push people into a situation where this is revived, and I hope it is. Uh, Ambassador Gottlieb. No, the mic. No, I'm, we're going to wait for responses. No, no. No, no, no. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple of points. I, I, um, this, the theme of the panel this afternoon is national security and international affairs. And I guess I, I'm one that thinks that uh, there is a relevance between the behavior of the United States towards Canada in connection with uh, our bilateral relations, the freedom of movement, goods, uh, and, and uh, our foreign policy. I, I don't think myself that there is a more important question in terms of our national interest than the uh, successful addressing of what's happening in our border. The costs of this are basically eroding the gains we've made at NAFTA. And they're really, I think, uh, I'd have to, uh, I've said it before, and I'm glad that Jan has articulated so well, I think it, um, it, 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 it is a disgrace that we have come, we are, we, we, we are arriving in a situation where we are today. Uh, you can go from, from Lisbon to Bulgaria without going through an immigration uh, stop or security, and you can't go from Toronto to New York. Uh, this is uh, without the greatest degree of harassment. If, if foreign policy isn't about this, then uh, you know, give me a break. Uh, take foreign policy somewhere else. This is, what, this is where the national interest lies. Secondly, it was a lot of discussion about the role Canada can play uh, for those of you who have been around the Canadian scene for a long time, you know this is a subject we love to discuss. Uh, Paul has put a brilliantly optimistic picture on Canada's ability to play a big role, bigger role. And it is a fact, and I, I agree with him, and I said this morning, we are moving into an international environment with many players, many significant sovereign states, 
all pursuing national interests. But to me, from the standpoint of the distance that I can bring from my long retirement, I, I, I think that the role that Canada can play, if it can play a role, in, in terms of the general agenda of the world, our concerns, uh, is, is, got, is got to be opportunistic. It's got to be related to the situation as it arises. And it's not going to come, as a view that I've expressed before, from any great foreign policy studies of what Canada can do, or what is our comparative advantage, or what are our strengths. It's going to be opportunistic. And the question is, it's bound to be optimistic, because you can't foresee the future very well. And half the disputes we're dealing with today, we weren't dealing with all that long ago. So, but to be opportuni to, 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 to play a role, we can be, if we're opportunistic. But we can't, unless we have the resources. And I can't think of anything more important in the resources than the human resources. And we've been neglecting them for a long time. It wasn't by accident by the way, let me step back in history. It wasn't by accident that there was a man called Lester Pearson who helped to create UNEF for the... He was part of a culture. And he was one of a number of people, let me say without giving offense to any Pearsonians, um, of equal intellectual stature. When the United States put together, when Secretary Stettinius put together the first list of, uh, of American candidates to be the first Secretary General of the, United, of the United Nations in 1945. There were four on that list. There were two Canadians. The top of the list was Norman Robertson, and the second was Lester Pearson. But we had a culture that attracted, forgive me, the brightest and the best. And if you have talent, you can make a, and if you have knowledge, and you have exposure, then you may be able to help. And Washington, the doors will open if we have something to say. As I said this morning, George Saltz, when he, you know, the biggest issue the United States faced was relations with the Soviet Union. He, he, he had barely sat down in his chair when he said he wanted to talk to a Canadian, a retired Canadian. Well, Ford was a product of that Foreign Service. Uh, it, it, was, it was a scholar. He was a poet, he was a translator, he had vast connections with the dissidents, he was, he was a figure of immense significance. He, we, he was there for 15 years and we left him there because he was invaluable and because of the exposure, the talent, and the understanding of the system. So it was opportunistic. We had the talent and we can play a role. Thank you very much. Um, at the back, Good. Thank you. In 1960, my girlfriend, her mother, and I drove across the border from Montreal to Plattsburgh, filled up the trunk full of toilet paper, Cheerios, or cornflakes, and whatever else we could buy drove back across the border. There was some momentary tension as to whether the customs agent was going to ask us to open the trunk, which, which would have cost an extra $20 to give him to ignore what he saw. Uh, and I have to say, those were the days and, uh, of a very thin border, and it's sad that that no longer is the case. But let me say something a little more seriously. I'm very glad that someone said something actually that made what Richard Johnston and I did relevant. And that is that the notion that there is in either the United States or Canada in the general public a widespread notion of we are North Americans as one, there's just no evidence for that. Certainly you can word questions in a way that gives people a chance to name multiple identities and that will be there. Bob Pastor mentioned that. They do this in Europe too. Do you think of yourself as a German or as a European? People say both. And then you say, well, what do you think of first, German or European? They say German. And that's, you know, for the moment that's it. I think a lot of these international integration uh, Projects are elite projects. They come from above, as everyone 
has said. And I was just trying to think, is there some kind of analogy, and going back to have a question for Roberta, but you know, Steve, our former colleague, Ernie Haas, had this theory of European integration, which essentially meant you solve one task cooperatively, and people say, hey, we could have worked together, it worked, we trust each other, now let's try something else, and gradually, you know, you get this sense of, of uh, the possibility of this kind of uh, task expansion at, at an institutional level. And it seems to me that that's more realistic than thinking that somehow you're going to, uh, through some civic education project, get, to th get a lot of people to think in these broader terms. But I have a specific question, because you mentioned something of great interest, and that's this drug problem. You know, that seems to me an issue where who would disagree that there are common interests? Uh, who would disagree that there, you know, this is something should be done about this? You know, you are venturing into the Bay Area. We keep you in the Brower Center. We don't drive you to downtown Oakland or Richmond where you might get shot because of some drug-related war. Because it happens every single day. And every weekend we have was this a good weekend? What was the body count, you know, this, this, this weekend? So my question is, why is this not an area, or maybe it is, that something is being done, and if that can be done and it can work, it can have some kind of a demonstration effect. And I know this is, in a way, a national security issue as well. So, say, save the answer if you don't mind. I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to two more interventions on the floor. Um, back at the, the red tie behind you. Thank you for this opportunity. I, uh, my name is Peter Dumont, and I'm a, a prime founder of a nonprofit organization, a grassroots initiative for peace education that's about 25 years old. And we're not really visible, but we've prepared carefully uh, Something, I, I, let me say, I have a question, but in order to state my question, I have to share a little bit. So I'll try to be really brief. So we're promoting a set of defined quality of life peace ethics for all. And we feel it is very important for global security and national security that peace education and inspiration in some practical way be promoted to the masses around the world. Okay, question. So the question is, how do we approach our United States government, how do we approach the government of Canada to, if, if there's a real urgency to it, if, if, if there's something really there that we could contribute, how do we get funded and, and taken seriously and get some advocacy uh, for big business reconciliation and support that I think we deserve. Okay, one last comment from the floor, uh, Dr. Pastor. Thank you. Uh, Janice, I'm gonna ask a very uncomfortable question for you and the two Canadians. Um, you started by saying that your international posture is a source of some currency uh, and importance in the relationship with the U.S. So therefore, there's a, the, the proposition critically, I said. And therefore, the, the question really goes to a tension between the extent to which Canadian foreign policy is viewed as a national interest in and of itself and the extent to which it's part of a source of potential currency with the United States mm -hmm. um, that can be used to advance other interests. Uh, I asked a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, an official in the US government why he felt that the president had changed the position on the Buy American provision instead of just stalling, as is the want of American presidents on these issues for decades. Uh, he did go ahead with it, and they said, well, it had to do with Afghanistan and perhaps a change in the position. He, now, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if he knew uh, whether it was true or not, but in fact, Roberto also suggested that this is obviously a source of great importance to the United States. And the question is whether, how would you feel if the trade-off came to you? Um, uh, would you, and if you did, um, uh, would you uh, 
be too afraid of seeming crass of perhaps offering uh, a one-year extension at a time, which is, of course, the way the parliaments work. And Congress works when they do trade-offs on domestic policy, which is what you're talking about. Uh, come back next year, and we'll see what we can get uh, for it next year as well. So that's the question, is whether, whether uh, you want to focus on those areas that the United States gives the highest priority in exchange for trying to elicit uh, attention and good policy, not just good words. Uh, from the United States on a, on a key domestic concern. Okay, thank you, Bob. We've had um, several commentaries, and the panel is free to respond to any of them. There are two or three specific questions, one relating to the drug problem, one relating to uh, this could open a floodgate of applicants for, uh, by people who are looking for, for help from the government, how peace education might find public support in, in uh, Canada or the United States, and the third, uh, uh, Bob's, Bob Pastor's question. So I'll accept whoever wants it. Paul. On the first question, I think you have to find your own billionaire. <laughs> uh, and I won't say more than that. Um, second question, I wanted to, it's, it's a variation on the theme, but that's, the theme is governance. Alan was talking about uh, we, have to be, um, we have to be opportunistic. One of the things that we've been quite good at, historically, is governance. We must be good at it. We're the only country that doesn't have banks failing, and you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that we seem to be doing right. We have a national health care program and so on. So if we're good at governance, and if we're heading into a world of multi, uh, sort of a multi-centric world, I wouldn't call it a multipolar world, because it's a little hard for me to see there's only, you can have one or two poles, but you know, I don't think I have multi-poles. Multi-centric world, governance is gonna become almost an end in itself, or maybe it will actually be an end in itself, if we're gonna to try to keep the world peaceful. So that's one of the things that I was thinking of, that we can opportunistically uh, probably do something quite significant. Uh, what, the, the third question was, what would we think if somebody offered us a trade-off of, uh, Afghanistan for, for uh, free trade or for um, buy America, I wouldn't touch it in a million years. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what I think of Afghanistan, I'm, I'm, but I am moved by the arguments that Obama has been making. Maybe I'm just susceptible to them, I don't know. But if the United, the United States really thinks this is an important issue, if the British are, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I know the history of Iraq and, and the British as best ally and vicarious power uh, player and all of that sort of thing. But nonetheless, if our two principal allies both think this is worth investing in, um, maybe we at, our, at least have a very serious debate about whether, whether we should just leave in 2011. Because this is, if you want to have a, a relationship with the Americans, I think, of sort of partnership, rather than just being clients, I think you have to take on some of the, th the thinking that, uh, that is motivating the, the way they're behaving. And if we agree with it, we should you know, draw the consequences. If we disagree with it, then we have to say, sorry, we disagree with it. But in terms of trading economic benefits for, for military activity, I, I, don't, I don't think so. The, um, uh, we are at the end of our time. I'm going to let the uh, let panelists respond and thank everyone for their participation. Janice. Uh, just let me say that I agree with Alan that the border is eroding the fabric of the relationship between Americans and Canadians. Yeah, and it's eroding it, and we are paying the higher adjustment rate, frankly. Um, and as I think it's very difficult for Americans who don't understand it and don't experience it on a daily basis, but you reach a point where Canadians think twice, do they want to come here? because of the costs. Um, and so I agree that we, we have to have a conversation about this. I don't know how we do it. We've tried for four years. We've gotten nowhere. Um, but I think it's a critical issue. And I think it's poisonous uh, for the relationship. And I think it's antithetical to thinking as a North American, Paul, because you experience it. People experience it. And that's their sense. Uh, I also want to, and, and I, I made this point, and I said, would we take yes from the United States? Were the United States to say yes, we want greater participation. We've disinvested in our foreign service. We've disinvested um, in a whole set of instruments and tools, and you can't have quality participation 
Yeah, you can't if you don't, if, you can, if we continue to disinvest. You know, which leads me very quickly to Paul's point when you talked about American higher education, which has been really a, a key pillar for American engagement with the world. There is a process of disinvestment going on in the United States in, in American higher education at the public level. Every single indicator you meant was backward looking. People win Nobel Prizes for work they did 25 years ago. You look at the number, I mean the figures are astonishing if you don't know them. Look at the Chinese investment in higher education. And look at the numbers of Chinese PhDs in science and engineering and computer science. Now the quality is still here, but for how long when Chancellor Bergenau started the day the way he did, right? So I think, I, I, I don't think we can look forward with, with utter confidence on this. The drug trafficking story is a really interesting story because I just came back from Mexico City um, where I spent two weeks with a similar group of people and the p level of paranoia about kidnapping and personal violence, I've never experienced. I know I've been in some very rough war zones. I've never seen people you know, as frightened to go out because they fear their child is going to be. Now, what's the underlying story? There was collaboration between the United States and Mexico. They knocked off the heads of the drug cartels. They destabilized it. The violence actually happened after there was a North American approach to the thing, and there's now an open arena for competition as to who moves up. And that's when you've had this massive upsurge in violence in Mexico City, which is actually terrifying people. So the Mexican academics are not anxious, frankly, for a North American solution, even though they recognize that there's a North American problem. And I think it's, it's, it's a worthwhile <laughs> caution. An oh, end to oh, North American oh, demand. No, the That's a different story. Occur afterwards, we've That's got to finish the story. Finally, I agree with Paul. You cannot trade economic interest. Uh, if Canada believes, his comment was right, if Canada believes that it is in our national security to be in Afghanistan, the government should have and must articulate that argument in a way that's persuasive to Canadians. It hasn't. And I, again, we're on Chatham House rules. The Prime Minister. We're not, by the way. Uh, yes, we are. It's it's we, we, I've declared. It's been, it's been I stopped. I stopped. <laughs> Don't be alarmed, anybody, by Ambassador Kinsman's <laughs> intervention. He, he and I will look after. In the American tradition, we will look after the tape. Uh, <laughs> Roberta briefly, and then Steve briefly. Um, just a couple things. I think um, on the on the security situation in Mexico. Um, for better or worse, um, it's a North American solution only because the Mexicans asked for it. Uh, the Mexicans have never, ever come to the United States with a request like that before, uh, had never wanted to partner with us in this fashion, uh, and did at the beginning of the Calderon administration when, as the President put it, he thought he had a tumor in the Mexican body, uh, and what he discovered was that it had metastasized throughout the entire body, and he needed more help than he was going to be able to provide. and so. As we looked at that and look at the result, the result is exactly as you would expect it to be. And, and I don't mean that to sound callous to the violence. This is exactly what happens when you go after organized crime. Uh, they fragment, they fracture, they get more violent in fighting for less turf. Uh, and in fact, because their profits are down, they go into extortion and kidnapping and other forms of criminality to keep their pipeline up. So I, I just, I, I don't want to look at it and say, well, this is success, because it's not. Nobody would argue that. Uh, but it is part of the process. Um, and in fact, there are Canadian trainers uh, at the uh, high level, uh, the Senior Police Academy in San Luis Potosi. Um, and there is a lot of work being done jointly uh, and looking at whether we can do more uh, together in Mexico that I think is room for, for a lot of, of additional discussion and, and productive work, and I think that's terrific. Um, I guess the only other thing that I would say is um, I don't disagree with the way Janice and others have framed uh, the debate about uh, you know, Afghanistan and, and other things, and I know how hard it is, and I, I want to make sure that I acknowledge the, the losses that are disproportionate that Canada has taken. Um, but Bob laid it out perhaps in its most uh, crass fashion. Uh, but I did see in the paper that we all got 
Uh, and in some of the, the presentations that Janice and Stephen made, a sort of a, well, you know, we really did step up on Afghanistan, and what did we get for it? <coughs> so I guess I was thinking that actually there was something owed that wasn't delivered. But I hope not, actually. Um, just to end on two very quick um, interrelated um, upbeat points, actually, at a, at, at a somewhat higher level. Uh, I, I just want to um, endorse and, and, and uh, underline what Ambassador Gottlieb said about um, the importance of uh, human capital. I think that uh, in a time uh, that we all feel will be an era of great uncertainty and looming disequilibria, I mean, there are, if there is one robust policy to follow that pays off almost regardless of what happens. It is a policy of creating or enabling human resource magnets um, in the regions where you, know, you want them to be. I, I would simply say, as exciting as hopeful that is, we have got some very, very determined competitors on that score. We are in no way uh, the only place in the world that thinks really hard about that. Um, and there are others who are quite willing to disrupt us on that score. Um, second. Um, uh, you know, with all um, uh, appropriate sort of uh, bowing to the, you know, tactics, strategy, opportunism, uh, policy making, and so on and so forth. Um, I think, you know, um, opportunism is right. That's the way everything happens in the world. Um, but, you know, luck favors the prepared. And I would just sort of maybe leave us with the following question, um, which to my mind hints at some of the strengths of what is actually a commonality of, I think, um, uh, or potentially a commonality of the North American society such as it is. Um, I, I would have to say similar to what I just said about human uh, capital magnets being a kind of a robust view of what works um, almost regardless of what comes over the next decade, I would say that the following is true too. If we had a plausible answer to the question of you know, what kinds of societies and regimes are best positioned to shepherd and facilitate the movement of human beings, and I explicitly say human beings, not political systems, through rapid technological change, ambient anxiety, which I think we're gonna have a lot of over the next decade, demographic transitions, and really quite you know, high amplitude changes in the way we see the world and the way we experience the world, crises as it were. Um, that's a question that feels like you know, it would be a very high level, but any tactics we can draw and any opportunities we can position ourselves for in answer to that question are probably something around which we might be able to get a little bit more joint action. So I'd leave it at that. Let me thank uh, the panel and uh, also thank the room for a session that I think was quite interesting.